So good morning. I too would like to begin with a, a thank you to the Marcy program, both for its uh, help, uh, assistance, support throughout the years, but even more importantly, for the beautiful um, community of scholars and families that have uh, so enriched uh, my life. So at the height of George Moss's career, 60s, 70s, 80s, uh, and early 90s, the academic debates about the essence and history of nationalism were largely anchored in Cold War ideological landscape of the day uh, and interwoven with modernization theory. Uh, so as of sort of mid-century, uh, um, theories of nationalism focused on the, the question of nationalism contested uh, modernity. Now this, however, was not the case for Marcy, whose monumental work uh, on the topic sought to situate nationalism within the history of culture broadly defined, not merely in relation to stages of modernization, industrialization, and so forth. For Marcy, the question was less about when exactly nationalism emerged, but how nationalism works, uh, and how has this ideology managed to so seamlessly uh, render itself culturally self-evident, ingrained in aesthetic, in education, in morals, uh, and morality. He focused on these other questions, I'd like to argue, because his entire interrogation of nationalism was anchored not so much in the landscape uh, of the Cold War present, but in that of Nazism. So to begin with, uh, Mossy's widely recognized interventions in the study of nationalism maybe should be uh, mentioned. The, the first was to take the concept of nationalism as the civic religion uh, of modernity, which was present as of the 1920s in the writing of Carlton, Carlton Hayes, and sort of fully um, flesh it out. Uh, and that means the analysis of rituals, of liturgy, of festivals uh, and monuments, of myth and symbols. And uh, Alex spoke about it just um, now, about one uh, element of that. And in studying those largely uh, visual sources, truly sort of visually oriented uh, work, mostly in, in his words, advanced the history of nationalism beyond the preoccupation of an older generation with its written sources, quote end. Mossy's second um, big intervention in the field was to show how the construction of nationalism and the regime of sexuality uh, were interwoven uh, through the historical alliance between nationalism and respectability. And of course, in both interventions, in both fields, uh, Mossy paved the way to many later scholars who uh, soon followed. So, what I think is equally important, but much less recognized than what Mossy wrote uh, about nationalism is how he wrote uh, about uh, what he did. And I would like to argue today that Mossy, for various and probably biographical uh, reasons, was more and more attuned than most to the emotive aspects, not only of nationalism, but also of explaining nationalism. Explaining nationalism is not a simple task that could be satisfied with a sufficient amount of evidence and sound reason. Rather, it is by essence a renegotiation with a worldview that, that professes to define us. Nationalism could include us or exclude us. It could be celebrated or marginal, marginalized by nationalism, it, empowered or victimized. And Marcy, um, tellingly, notably, referred to his young self as, quote, a victim of uh, nationalism. So Moses writing on nationalism is filled with tons of uh, many moves, often provocative moves, that strike me as rooted in a deep understanding of this emotive element of explaining nationalism and is aimed to offset the reader's partiality and thus sort of allowing, allowing them um, to gain a more complex understanding of how nationalism uh, works. So the key term here is partiality. It is notoriously hard um, to keep a coherent position or a disposition vis-a-vis -vis nationalism as such. We tend to tolerate and even praise the national sentiments and aspirations of some as patriotism, 
and at the very same time to reject the national sentiments and aspirations of others as chauvinism. The problem here, of course, uh, with such an approach is its failure to characterize and evaluate the sine qua non of nationalism, that, is share, that which is shared by both good nationalism and bad, both you know, the serpent and the dog, if you, if you will. Theoretically, Ernst Gellner noted, there could be nationalist in the abstract, generously preaching the, the doctrine uh, for all nations alike. In fact, however, nationalism has often not been so sweetly reasonable nor so rationally symmetrical. It may be, as Immanuel Kant believe, that partiality, the tendency to make exceptions on our own behalf, on our own case, on our own case, uh, own case is the central human weakness from which all others flow, and this, uh, that it infects national sentiments as it does or else, quote, end. In 1979, in an interview, George Mossy stated, and I quote, I think all nationalism is bad. All my books are written against nationalism. Yet, as we will show in a bit, and as many of you know, and as Stephen's uh, talk has mentioned, he was more forgiving and more understanding of Zionism than any other national movement. And still, I'd like to argue that the strength of Marx's writing on nationalism is not only in its breadth or its rigor, and certainly not in its precision, but in effectively engaging the challenge of partiality in assessing uh, nationalism, and thus sort of making his reader aware of the emotive elements of explaining nationalism. So what I'm gonna do, um, in the next couple of minutes is to show a little bit uh, how he addresses those pitfalls in his writings on nationalism and then to conclude by discussing what he calls his personal contradictions regarding Israeli nationalism. And here again I will meet, I guess, uh, with the uh, questions that were, ra were raised both by Stephen and Arik and Adi. Um, so, though his 1961 um, culture of Western Europe included general chapter on nationalism, it is only his 1965 crisis of German ideology, his study of folkish uh, nationalism, which constitutes Mossy's first book uh, on nationalism. The Nazi horizon of his analysis um, of, uh, of nationalism, which we mentioned earlier, um, was overt. Hitler's own nationalism, Moses stated in the preface, was a product of folkish thought. Moses' interesting intervention in this book uh, was in an unorthodox mapping of the discourses of a German uh, folkism, which, uh, of, or, the, the, or the discourses out of which uh, German folkish nationalism emerged. The gallery of interlocutors uh, in these disc discourses of German folkism included on the one hand many sort of repressed, petty bourgeois, humorless, parochial, Puritan prudes, and on the other hand, it included utopian-minded dreamers, new agey bohemians, uh, eccentric, I don't know, hippies, uh, and in the depiction of both, one, I believe, could trace some scorn of the half-educated, the eccentric, folkish outsider, in some regard. Um, I would like to suggest that Moss's depiction of their personalities and lifestyles, uh, which contains a degree of ridicule, though factually accurate, also offers a reassuring exorcism uh, of sorts, driving out, as it were, the specter of folkism, breaking thus the spell of that very folkism which upended the lives of a young George Mossy. Uh, also, in his later works of, on nationalism, Mossy would seek out and relish on the ridiculous, on the grotesque, uh, for the very same effect. So if the eccentric face of folkism had a reassuring effect, Mossy seemed to have achieved the opposite effect in addressing other unlikely participants in the discourses of German folkism, unlikely as far as ideology and background are concerned. So Marxists, progressive educational reformers, so-called half-Jews, Zionists. Moses' report on the discussion of the settlement or the um, uh, Boden reform movement weaves together not only Jewish thinkers like uh, Herzka or Franz Oppenheim, Oppenheimer, but most prominently the Zionist kibbutzim, uh, 
So here the effect seemed to corrode a sense of a reassuring divide between us and the folkists. Indeed, even the divide between would-be perpetrators and would-be victims is compromised. The, danger, the dangerous ideas are not quarantined. We are all susceptible. Indeed, much of the crisis of German ideology in later books is grounded in the nationalist indoctrination that Mossi himself absorbed in his um, German boarding school and which he, quote, found congenial at the time, quote, end. So, for purposes of time, I bundled together Mossi's 1975 nationalization um, of the masses, the, this masterpiece, and his equally magisterial 1990 um, Fallen, Soldier, Fallen Soldiers. These are clearly different books, uh, but the intervention regarding nationalism I find sufficiently similar. Um, many of the themes and moves that were mentioned earlier are present also in nationalism, nationalization of the masses. Um, though a study of nationalism in general, also here the Nazi horizon is unmistakable. Indeed, the title, Nationalization of the Masses, as all of you uh, know, is a quote from Hitler's uh, Mein Kampf. Also here, Mosse has an eye for the half-educated, for the unrefined, to the grotesquely monumental. Some of the most memorable chapters of Fallen Soldiers discuss the trivialization of memory, uh, the memory of the war experience, the kitsch, the war toys, the battlefield tourism, etc. Uh, also, in these nationalist projects, both socialists and Jews participated. Uh, one example that he sort of highlights is uh, Hertz or Theodore Hertz, the Zionist. Uh, Mossi tells us envisioned national festivals with gigantic spectacles and colorful profession, uh, pro processions. Uh, in both books, Mossi, on the one hand, presents the emotive draw of nationalism, which, as he writes, quote, a written description cannot capture. On the other hand, the myth, symbols, ceremonies, rituals, all of them are actually scripted, all of them are staged, and none of it is authentically spontaneous. So arguably, there's an exorcism of sorts uh, also here, disrupting the aesthetic illusion of national self-representation. Nationalism and sexuality, which Mosses started writing in the early 80s, presents an alliance, not a merger, uh, between nationalism and respectability in the early uh, 19th century Europe. By, constituting, uh, by, by constituting normalcy, this alliance established ethnic, cultural, and sexual insiders and outsiders. Those outsiders mostly stressed were constructed as a threat from the very beginning. Also, in this book, Nazism serves as the focal point of Marx's intervention uh, on, on nationalism. I quote, national socialism, he stated, provided the climax to the alliance of nationalism and respectability, quote, end. The book exposes a major biographical aspect in uh, Mossi's treatment of nationalism, as it is evident how, in his own life, these two regimes pointing to his outsider status intersected. Quote, my status as a real or potential outsider, as a Jew, living in a decidedly hostile environment during the, my formative years, was bound to leave its mark, as was well my existence as a sexual outsider, which, if known, would have blocked any chance of advancement, quote end. Now, in late life, once Jerusalem became one of his homes, there is something noteworthy uh, and not unproblematic in his treatment of nationalism, something that he himself identified as, quote, personal contradictions in need of some resolution. On the one hand, Mossi, the outsider, chose to wear his outsiderdom uh, as a badge of honor, stating unapologetically that he remains an immigrant and insinuating certain virtues of statelessness. Proclaiming, as mentioned earlier, that all nationalism is bad and that all his books are written against nationalism. On the other hand, not only does his late work include praise of early Zionists, but he himself develops and documents an emotional sense of national belonging. So twice in his memoir, he describes getting very emotional seeing the swearing in of um, Israeli paratroopers 
in uh, Masada. So how can we explain that seeming discrepancy, which Morsi himself identified as contradictory? And I think here, um, three different aspects are uh, at play. So the academic piece of it is a potentially rather trivial. Morsi's, uh, Morsi eventually came to accept the position of many other scholars of nationalism, seeing a decline, as it were, historical decline, um, from a benign liberal type of nationalism to an aggressive illiberal one. And again, quotes on the liberal and the illiberal. Uh, he came to identify such a development in French and German nationalism. So his praise of some early Zionists simply applied that model uh, of the decline of nationalism to Israeli history. In addition, rather than affirming Israeli state ideology, he seems to have criticized it. He wrote that in Israel, a new kind of nationalism, I'm quoting, attempted to supersede what, has promi what had promised to be an interesting experiment in liberal nationalism, right? So it creates a juxtaposition between the new state ideology and the old one. Then there's a biographical element which also was never hidden. If we said earlier that Moss's investigation of nationalism was anchored in the lessons of Nazism, then his greater appreciation of Zionism, attributing it a great degree of, quote, realism, may be the other side of that same coin. Cosmopolitanism could offer little help for the outcast, outcast the exile, the outsider persecuted by nationalists. Having a strong nation of one's own may very well make an existential uh, difference. And there's a quote to this effect in uh, just a minute. So finally, his um, emotional reaction to Israeli nationalism was not something entirely new either. Um, he was never immune and never claimed to have been immune to the emotive aesthetic draw of nationalism. It is probably for this reason that he pioneered the studies of nationalism tacitly seductive feature. Uh, nationalism for him was never only something external that other, people's, other people do and believe, but always also something internal, something that we too may very well find ourselves doing or professing. Um, his memoir is filled with beautiful uh, quotes and examples to this effect. Um, he was deeply impressed by the German nationalist indoctrination of his boarding school, Hermannsberg. He loved the historical novels, he tells us in the memoir, the, the excursions in the German landscape, the war games, and as he put it, quote, when, as a historian much later, I wrote about German nationalism, I did have an insight into its truly seductive nature, quote, and in Britain, he wholeheartedly joined the deafening applause to a jingoistic speech of Randolph uh, Churchill in favor of conscription. Arriving in America, he was extremely emotional at the side of the, side of the Statue of uh, Liberty, adding in his memoir, sometimes, even though you are aware of the myth which surrounds such well-worn symbol and are determined not to be affected, your emotions nevertheless are aroused, and so it was on this occasion, quote, and. And then the other Israeli paratroopers, and I quote, my view that European nationalism had been and was the greatest enemy of the Jews never changes. And yet, when I saw the new Israeli army and it, or attended the swearing in of the paratroopers in Masada, my heart beat faster. I knew the danger of being captured by images and liturgy and had written enough, uh, often enough, uh, about the use in manipulating people. But I myself, uh, was far from immune to the irrational forces, which as a historian, I deplore, especially when it uh, came to that group, which I regarded my own, quote, end. Now, Marcy, I would, uh, should state, was not alone uh, in his ambivalence of, on the one hand, writing very despairingly about nationalism uh, and its emotional and intellectual manipulations, and on the other hand, feeling an obstinate sense of national belonging. Benedict Anderson admitted that he was, in his way, and I quote, a little nationalistic. Even Ernst Gellner went, uh, he, uh, Ernst Gellner went even further, confiding, quote, I do not think I could have written that book on nationalism which I did write 
were I not capable of crying with the help of some alcohol uh, over folk songs, songs which happened to be my favorite kind of music, quote end. Those of you who had the pleasure of um, reading Moss's memoirs may remember that Sholem leveled at him the very same accusation that he leveled at Hannah Arendt, lack of love uh, of the Jewish people. Uh, Moss claims to have dutifully responded in the very same manner as she, um, that he loves only individuals and he cannot see uh, how one could love a whole people. In his memoir, uh, however, Mossi admitted, and Stephen related to it, uh, Mossi had admitted that his answer to Sholem was disingenuous. For I did feel a sense of belonging, close to love, even as I taught the lasting importance of rationality and of the Enlightenment. There was always a certain pull towards realism, uh, to the feeling that if one did not belong to a strong nation, one could slide back to the statelessness I had experienced. And here, statelessness is evidently only a negative thing. Go then. The formation of Moss's concept of uh, nationalism, to conclude, seems to go back to the forced migration of around the age 15. Moss drew from the 30s, or seemed to have drawn from the 30s, um, um, what he seems to have drawn from the surgeon seems to be a sense of just how unbelievably dangerous nationalism could become. Another lesson was that cosmopolitanism, cosmopolitanism could offer little help to the outcast persecuted by nationalists. Now, having experienced, quote, the seductive nature of German nationalism before becoming, and I quote again, victim of that very nationalism shaped a critical historian for whom nationalism is not only them, but also us, a penetrating historian effectively pointing to nationalism's manipulations, also our own nationalism, and to, uh, to the deceivingly porous boundaries between our benign nationalism and ethno-nationalism. And this kind of scholarship is exactly what we need today more than ever. Thank you. Thank you.